Hello and welcome back to goldstocktrades.com. Today we have a new and special guest with us, Kerry Knoll. Kerry is executive chairman of Darnley Bay Resources, which can be traded as DBL on the TSX Venture and as DNLYF on the OTC. Thanks, Kerry, for being here with us today. Well, thanks for having me on. Kerry, let's talk about your background. You have such a unique background. You started off as a journalist and you became an entrepreneur and you built some very successful companies in the mining space. Could you talk a little bit about that unique background that you have? Sure. Uh, I, I started off as a as a journalist, uh, financial journalist initially, and then I focused on mining uh, with a Canadian publication called The Northern Miner, where I, I spent six years uh, visiting mines, interviewing miners, going to mining conferences, um, and basically learning the business. And um, like so many people from the outside, it looked it looked pretty easy and pretty lucrative. And uh, so I, in 1987, so 30 years ago, I made the jump and uh, started my first mining company. And talk to us about some of the successful companies that you've helped build. I mean, if you know, I, I know Thompson Creek and and Wheaton River. Well, um, in, in the first 20 years, and I, 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 I actually retired in uh, 2007. I've, I've come out of retirement a couple of times because I, I really do enjoy the business. But over the first 20 years, and I had a partner, Ian McDonald, and the two of us started three companies over that time. One was called uh, Glencairn Gold, and one was called uh, Wheaton River Minerals, and uh, one was called, uh, eventually called Thompson Creek. And so by the time I retired, um, all three of the shares from all three of those companies by 2007, every share we'd ever issued was trading on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, I don't know the entire market cap of all three together, but it was many billions of dollars. And, and, uh, one of them, Glencairn Gold, got taken over by a company called B2, which is a successful gold company now and still operates two of the mines that uh, that we had in Nicaragua. We, uh, When I left Glencairn in 2007, we had 1,200 employees. Um, Thompson Creek at that same year, um, when I left active management and, and just stayed on the board, uh, had 800 employees. So the two companies that we were still running at that point, had upwards of 2,000 employees, and and then of course there was Gold Corp. Um, then in uh, I've had some uh, some not as successful companies since that time. I want to be upfront about that. I started a, I didn't start, but I joined a company called Canada Lithium in 2010, and uh, we built a mine, and the mine worked fine, but the the refinery didn't work. It was had me- constant mechanical failures, and eventually that. Uh, that company didn't make it. That was in the lithium business. And then, uh, although we did get taken over uh, before uh, at uh, at one point by one of Lucas Landin's companies. And uh, so more recently now I've started, uh, not started, but transformed uh, along with uh, a new partner, Jamie Levy, uh, a company called Darnley Bay. And uh, we have picked up what I think is probably the best zinc asset around. And the reason I I say that is because it's a project that I think we can get into production within three years, and there aren't too many of those out there. There are a few, um, but ours ours uh, has a lot to, uh, a lot of benefits that I think some of the other ones don't have. And, uh, you know, it's an open pit, for example. It's got great infrastructure. It's in the Northwest Territories, which is probably one of the most pro-mining areas in the world, the Northwest Territories of Canada. Um, We've got uh, more than 4 billion pounds of zinc identified from past operators, uh, the stuff that they left behind. This was a very, very profitable mine back in the 19... uh, 
60s, 70s, and 80s, and uh, at that point, uh, it, it closed as the zinc price was, was had a really bad time in 1987, the year that it closed. And the uh, owner at that time, which was Kaminko, which is now part of Tech, went on to other things, including Red Dog. So we we, uh, we were able to benefit from that. Well, Terry, why don't you give us a little bit of background about the zinc market, because there's been a lot of interest an uptick in zinc prices and in the zinc junior zinc sector. What's going on behind the scenes fundamentally with the zinc uh, story? Well, zinc is one of those commodities that uh, for for many years of my career, up until the about 2005 or so, it just never went anywhere. You know, year in, year out, it was 50 cents a pound, and that was where it was going to stay. And then in uh, 2006, 2007, it got into a bit of a deficit. And as soon as zinc got into a deficit, boom, went from 50 cents to $2 a pound. And, of course, then the crash came of 2008 and, and everything went down with it. And I started picking up uh, following zinc again about four years ago um, because of the planned closures of a few of the world's major zinc mines and nothing in the pipeline because the prices were low. It was uh, it was just apparent to me that the zinc was going to go up, and it was kind of one of those stories that became a joke in the mining business because every year, all the gurus said zinc's going to go up next year, and then the next year would come and it wouldn't go up, and that happened in 2014, 2015, and then it finally started happening towards the end of 2016, and that's when some of these closures were taking place. So what you're in a situation now, you've got a world market of about 14 million tons of zinc. And you've got continuing closures, very little new stuff coming along in the pipeline. And and you've got increased consumption every year because zinc is used. If you want to look to what's going to move the zinc market, it's cars. The average car in the world has 40 pounds of zinc in it. And as long as cars continue to make record sales every year, we're going to be using record amounts of zinc. And I think something towards 60% of the world's zinc is used in cars. And a lot of the rest of it is used in uh, in corrugated, uh, like roofing materials and that kind of thing. It's basically a rust preventative uh, almost everywhere that it's used. So you've got a situation where you've got no pipeline to speak of, certainly not enough to make up the deficit. Uh, going into the foreseeable future. Uh, Wood McKenzie, who is a, a very uh, astute uh, analysis firm out of Britain, has, has said that there is just, they made a, a bold, very general statement that there is not enough zinc in the pipeline to meet demand. And if they're correct on that, and they, they provide a lot of numbers to show why they, they think that, and it's it's not a statement that they make, have, have made very often or that I've ever seen them made it, make in the past. They think that um, they think that the prices have to move up, and they're they're looking at something around uh, right now. Zinc's around a dollar twenty-eight or something a pound. They're looking at a, a, a price averaging around between a uh, dollar fifty and a dollar seventy for the uh, next four to five years. So that's uh, certainly a, a, a lot higher price than today, and 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 it's certainly a price that we would uh, make a lot of money at at our our Pine Point project. Terry, the end of 2016 was very um, exciting for Darnley Bay uh, because you announced this uh, Pine Point deal. Talk to us about this project. What makes it so unique in the junior space and especially in the junior zinc space from a project perspective? Uh, and and talk to us about what you what you did in, uh, so far with bringing together some key technical people to get going. Okay, well, Pine Point was uh, was the world's most profitable zinc mine for many years, and those years would have been probably in the early 1970s and into the 80s. The reason for that was it had a very high grade and it was open pit. And 
it had a railroad to it and it had a power line going right by it and it had highways and it had a city uh, that, that Cominco had actually built called, called Pine Point. It no longer is there. So you had a very rich, very large zinc deposit, all open pit. And back in those days, they, they mined an average of 10% combined lead zinc, which is very rich rock for open pit. You, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, rock that is in, in excess of uh, Canadian dollars in, you know, more than $300 per, per ton of rock. And you're mining that probably for $30, $30. So you can see what kind of profitability that would be. In, uh, two, in 1987, they closed and they had left a lot of deposits behind. They mined out 52 separate deposits, but they left 46 behind. And of course, they left the lower grade ones. But at today's prices and at today's uh, mining costs, which have actually gone down for open pit mining over time in real dollars, those grades are, are fabulous grades. And uh, so we, we're in a unique position that we still have rail access we still have hydroelectric power, which is rare in the in the far north. We have a town nearby. We have an airport. We have all the all the things we need that we don't have to build and don't have to spend money on. So the capex to get this mine started would be very low, uh, comparatively, if it was if it was a more isolated place. And the other thing that we've got is we've got deposits that have already been drilled off and they're ready to start mining. All we need to do is we're, we're in the process of, uh, of doing a preliminary economic assessment because we need to do that um, in order to guide our feasibility study, which will be next. And after that, we're going to begin construction. And because these are open pit, they're very easy to start mining. You literally just start digging, and, and you, you're into ore immediately. Uh, most of the um, junior, what I would call junior zinc companies in the world, have underground deposits. They take many more years to develop and and a lot more money. I'm not saying they won't make money and I'm not saying they're not good projects, but the timelines are different and the, and the dollar amounts are different. So that's what kind of makes ours unique. There are some other open pits, but they're, they, each one has its own logistical problem. And, um, you know, it's just something that we don't have. We have good clean ore, which is rare in the zinc business. We have um, we have a government in the Northwest Territories who is very very pro mining. In fact, they're advertising for people to come up there and get involved in mining because they uh, they they know the value of the the mining jobs are a lot better than most other industries that they could potentially attract. So, Kerry, as we conclude here. Talk to us about some of the, the near-term um, catalysts or, or milestones that we should be looking forward to. Well, for us, um, I'll talk about us and I'll talk about the zinc market. So for us, the uh, main catalyst, of course, is the um, upcoming PEA, which is coming out. I don't know when it'll be finished, but they're promising us by sometime uh, mid-March around there. And uh, that, that will give some real interesting numbers as to what it will cost us to get zinc out of the ground and uh, what, what it will cost us to build the mine. And, you know, we're, we're anticipating that cost to build the mine in, in, in around the 100 to $140 million mark, depending on which size we, we eventually decide on. But that's a very low number for, for uh, a company that's going to be producing upwards of uh, – Two hundred million dollars in uh, worth of zinc a year. So um, we have that PEA coming out. Um, that'll be followed by a feasibility study over the next year. In the meantime, to that we are getting into a lot of drilling. We have a big drilling budget for this year, uh, five million dollars. Um, we, even though they've had ninety-eight distinct deposits in this district, there's a lot of areas that are still unexplored. And we're going to be going in and doing a lot of drilling on those. We're also going to be uh, drilling some of the uh, historical deposits uh, in order to bring them into um, what we call up here 43101, which is a, a compliant um, terminology in order to be able to talk about reserves and, and, 
and, and tons and grade and mining plans, you have to have a 43-101 report, and uh, we have to do drilling to, to accomplish that. So that's what we can look forward to. A lot of drilling results this summer, the results of the PEA, and uh, uh, just ongoing uh, building, building up of the size of this project. Um, other things that I think are happening is you're, you're going to see a couple of shocks, I think, in the zinc market. There was an interesting story in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago saying that uh, the one country where they don't use zinc in cars, or very much of it, is China and, and also in India, which are, of course, two of the top four car markets. They're the number one and number four, respectively, in the world. So you've got these that massive car markets that don't use zinc. And now they're discovering that the, the cars that they built 10 years ago in China are starting to rust. And now they're starting to advertise, well, we're going to put zinc in some of our better and more expensive cars so they last longer. And if uh, China goes much more into zinc than they are now, you're going to see quite a shock on the market. And I think that is something that could happen. Uh, it won't happen overnight. It'll be a gradual thing, but it w it's, it's going to squeeze an already tight market. And, and just the other thing that's happened is that the smelters, and those are the people that take our concentrate from our mine and turn it into final product, the the zinc smelters in the world are suffering because they cannot get enough zinc concentrate. So they're getting into a bidding war for concentrate, which means they're lowering the price that they process it for, which leaves more profit for the miner. And that could very positively impact our, our study. And we, we have a, a representative who just retired from tech, which is the biggest zinc producer in the world, um, he buys and sells concentrates for tech for the last 36 years, and he has joined us, and he is shopping our zinc concentrate around to the to the markets of the world. So I think once we have our uh, our feasibility study done and we we find some buyers for our zinc, I think that's going to be a very positive uh, move for for the stock as well. So, and and the thing that's happened with that is that the cost of processing a ton of zinc concentrate has gone from $200. To about fifty dollars in the last year, which of course leaves a lot more profit for the miner. Well, it's an exciting time to be a junior zinc developer. Darnley Bay Resources, Kerry Knoll, executive chairman, can be traded as DBL on the TSX Venture and as DNLYF on the OTC. Go get more information at Darnley Bay. Dot com d a r n l e y b a y dot com. Thank you so much, Kerry, for being here with us today. Thank you. Talk to you later.